So I see that my computer signals to me that it's 2 p.m. sharp, and that's why I'd like to start this webinar. First of all, I'd like to welcome all of you in Europe, hopefully all around the world, to this webinar about sleep and sleep disturbances during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to thank the European Sleep Research Society, especially Pierre Hervé and the members of the board. I'd like to thank Erica Schweppes and Jennifer Thompson for organizing this. I think this is a terrific idea to hold uh, such a webinar and to put together knowledge we have about uh, the pandemic. And we all live with the pandemic now for over 12 months, over a year. And I think we had our fair share of experiences with that. We know that sleep research Sleep medicine probably had really troubles with the pandemic because I guess that many, many sleep labs were closed at least last year in March, April due to the pandemic because we didn't know how to handle that. I think that has hopefully improved in the meantime with all the hygiene concepts we have. Now, before I go into further detail, I'd like to draw your attention to the slide all of you see and just mention a joint a symposium, a joint a meeting the European Sleep Research Society has with the European Respiratory Society. It's the Sleep and Breathing Symposium, which will be held virtually from April 15 to 17. We also will talk about COVID-19 at this symposium. I'd like to draw your attention to that and like to invite you to, to uh, attend this meeting. Okay, but back to COVID-19, which is the topic <laughs> today, and as, said, as I said before, we all had our experiences with it, personal, professional, and uh, I think we all as sleep researchers and sleep medicine specialists, we, we early realized that this will do something to our sleep. And as we put it uh, in, a, in a virtual issue in, in Journal of Sleep Research, which came out a few days ago, which brings together all the COVID-19 papers, uh, uh, which were published in Journal of Sleep Research up to now, we said, Actually, COVID-19, it doesn't stop uh, at the door to the bedroom. It doesn't stop before our beds. It has an impact. Uh, if you have COVID-19, definitely, it would, if you had it, it, it has an impact on your sleep. But you just, you don't have to have it in order to experience this, some, I'd say, mostly adverse effects the pandemic has. It's the fear, the uncertainty, uh, what, what will happen now. It's uh, changes in living circumstances we all go through. The lockdown had an impact for many people, home office, suddenly living together maybe uh, with five or six persons staying together the whole time in your apartment. Uh, th these were things which had a dramatic impact on people's lives. And I think in most cases, more a negative impact. There are definitely a few people who had maybe a positive experience with, with a home office in lockdown. Not having to get up at four or five in the morning might have a really relaxing effect on you. But I think these were just a few people where effects were measurable. And so today uh, we put together a panel of five specialists and experts from all over Europe uh, who covered different aspects of the effects the pandemic had or had on our sleep behaviors. And uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce now Marku Patinen. Uh, hi, Marku. Marku is one of the pioneers of European sleep research. Marku is based in Helsinki in Finland. Uh, he's a neurologist by medical speciality and a neuroscientist. And I think he started his career at Montpellier, I think, 50, more than 50 years ago as a medical student. And I think since then, he has had a strong impact on European sleep medicine, sleep research. And uh, he has, he submitted a paper together with the consortium of European authors, the Journal of Sleep Research, which we published very quickly about methodological aspects, how to study the impact of the pandemic on sleep. And I think that's a very important and Marco is going to give us an introduction now into the topic about the impact of COVID-19 on sleep, circadian problems, an overview, and how to study the impact, what to do. Marco, the stage is all yours. I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much.
so I think you see it. <clears throat> so um, thank you very much, and I will go straight on. Uh, nothing to disclose uh, uh, for this meeting. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about, <coughs> uh, about the sleep and uh, COVID, what has been done, about the hypothesis that we have had, and then about methods of uh, what we are doing in the so-called ICOS uh, project. A little bit more about RBD and the olfactory route, and then uh, a few words about the second survey that we are going to start. And I hope that uh, many uh, colleagues, many researchers from other countries uh, would perhaps join this uh, second survey. It hasn't. It will start within about one month. We are going to do. We are having a pilot right now to finalize the, uh, the tool. So uh, when I look for the publications on sleep and COVID, there was nothing, of course, before end of uh, uh, 2019. Uh, and if you now look, there have been totally one. Uh, uh, yesterday, 1,384 publications with the sleep uh, and the COVID, uh, 260 papers on insomnia and 94 papers on sleep apnea. In 2020, uh, almost 1,000 publications and already uh, by yesterday, uh, almost 400 publications. So right now we can tell that we can say that there are almost uh, uh, really several publications uh, more than uh, more than 100 publications uh, per month uh, so a huge number so what has been found out many things uh, Dieter already told about those I'm not going into details many of the uh, early researchers are uh, within us here today uh, so you will hear about about them. Um, uh, mostly increase of uh, insomnia and other symptoms. Uh, also uh, increase of sleepiness and fatigue. Uh, Study showing that sleep apnea uh, uh, seems to be a risk for developing a more, more severe form of COVID. Uh, then uh, decrease of social jet lag, uh, and for example, Celine is here. Uh, increase of dreaming and nightmares, uh, and, and as Dieter told, what is uh, uh, related directly to the COVID infection, to the viral infection, and what is rela related to the effects of the pandemic with the lock, uh, lock up confinement, uh, and so on, and so on. So uh, this is uh, one of the papers that uh, was uh, Dieter mentioned, published in the Journal of Sleep Research. Um, uh, about our project called ICOS. So what is this uh, ICOS? Uh, ICOS comes from International COVID-19 Sleep Studies. And one of the main aims is to harmon uh, is harmonization of the data, which would allow comparability of results within different countries. In the core group, uh, 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 you can see here is the core group. So I'm there, then Björn, Björn Watten from Norway, Frances Sung from uh, Toronto, Canada, uh, Colin Espy from uh, the UK, uh, Brigitte uh, uh, Holzinger from Austria, dream researcher, Charles Moran from Canada, and Thomas Penzel from Germany. And then we have um, um, uh, principal, in, uh, principal investigators in different countries. Uh, until now, we have had uh, like 13 different countries, uh, 15 centers. We have Brazil, uh, Motarolim, a dream researcher. In China, two centers, one in Northern China, Fang Han, and in Hong Kong, uh, uh, Dr. Wing. In France, we have two centers, uh, Montpellier, Yves de Villiers, uh, and Damien Leger uh, in Paris. Damien is going to have a talk today as well. Then in Italy, Giuseppe Plazzi uh, and uh, Luigi de Gennaro in Rome. At, in Tokyo, Yuji uh, uh, Inoue, uh, Poland, uh, Marius Siemiński, in Sweden, Jonathan Sedernais, uh, together with uh, Christian Benedict. And then uh, in the USA, Michael Nadorf. Uh, this year, we will have two new countries that co are going to join. And we have uh, agreed already. And one is Georgia, and another one uh, is Portugal. And I hope that there will be some more. 
the original hypothesis were uh, that uh, I go this quickly through so that first most problems would increase. And then uh, we were uh, hypothesizing that the coronavirus infection by itself would cause some of the problems by a biological route. But then many of the problems would be related to the psychosocial effects. So this was the idea to ma also make a difference. What is biological? What is uh, psychological? The methods that we are using, and, and this is one of the aims, that these are tools that can be used without having to pay, so they are free to use. You don't have to pay anything, uh, and uh, and we have a, uh, and they are all well validated and well working. So we have the basic Nordic sleep questionnaire for sleep disturbances. From there, we can have a, a many different scales. We have the RLS scale, UK Biobank for sleepiness. It works very nicely. We are measuring different parasomnias using a, a similar scale, five point scale RBD, uh, stop for sleep apnea, uh, chronotype, uh, post-traumatic uh, uh, stress disorder, ISI uh, is there for severity of insomnia, and then for uh, depression and anxiety, we, are, uh, we choose the short one, uh, CAT2 and PHQ2. Uh, then for quality of life, we have uh, visual analog scales or for quality of health. So two different questions. WHO quality of life scale, which is very, very good. It measures quality of life, but it can also be used to measure depression. We have uh, a single question on stress, which is well validated. And also in this study, it, it seems to work uh, very, very well. We are measuring physical activity in a quantitative way so that we can compute metabolic values for um, activity. And uh, that also uh, is, is, is a nice one. And then uh, alcohol, caffeine and smoking, and also alcohol can be converted to grams of alcohol per week so that we can see that how many grams of alcohol people are using. And then we are asking about a sense of smell and taste pre-existing diseases, and then about the COVID-19 symptoms, severity of disease, treatment, whether they have been in hospital, in hospital and so on. And then, of course, background variables, uh, gender, age, social status, financial suffering, family, profession, work, living area, ethnicity and education. And then, uh, not in all countries, but the, 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 we have an option for information on COVID-19 infection and different uh, symptoms and uh, information on confinement. Those who are interested can have the questionnaire. Uh, the link to, uh, to the questionnaire is in the Journal of Sleep Research. And you can also ask it, for example, from me or from any of the core group members. And you can freely use it. Uh, I will go very, very quickly some of the main figures. Here you just see the participating countries that we have had. The largest country was Japan with 7,000 participants. Altogether, we had uh, 26,500 participants in different countries. And then here you can see the uh, more women than men. Uh, age group, age dist distribution was uh, pretty nice. Uh, the median age uh, for women was 39 years, median age for men 40 years, so, and, and there, that, that is not statistically significant. So a very nice uh, overview of uh, adult people uh, in different continents, in different cultures. Uh, in the first survey that was done uh, pretty early during the pandemic, we have had uh, 740 cases of uh, uh, COVID, uh, like verified cases. We have many, many cases that we are not sure. In the analysis, we only take these 740. So <clears throat> what has been done already and where we have uh, submitted manuscripts uh, or, or we are on the way of submitting them is uh, sleep problems in different countries, sleep apnea and comorbidity uh, by Sung is the first author, insomnia uh, by Colin Espy and uh, Charles Moran, dreams and nightmares by uh, uh, Holzinger and, uh, and Luigi De Cenaro and others about the social jet lag uh, with uh, Sederness and others, effect of chronotype, uh, Ilona Mericanto, uh, RBD with Wing, uh, Yves Dovillier and others. 
and we are preparing a uh, manuscript on sleepiness and fatigue. And then we are, uh, we have some data. Uh, we have a lot of data and we are planning studies for quality of life and quality of health and effects of uh, physical activity. Uh, already now, interesting is that olfactory disturbance seems to be related to sleepiness and RBD, but not so much to fatigue. So this is very interesting. And if we now think about the, uh, uh, why is that? We know already from the uh, past uh, that, for example, influenza virus usually go, uh, goes to the uh, no nose and then uh, it goes to the olfactory nerve and travels via the olfactory nerve so that in about 28 days from uh, onset of uh, infection, in about um, one month uh, or four to six, eight weeks, it will reach uh, uh, the limbic system area, also hypothalamus, including also the orexin cells and including also many other centers that are important in sleep wake regulation, but also in regulation of emotions and, uh, uh, and in, in uh, mental uh, functioning. And now we know that in COVID infection, uh, at least 40% of patients uh, have a taste, uh, have olfactory dysfunction. So it's very common that, to have an olfactory dysfunction if one has a uh, COVID uh, uh, um, infection. And already it has been published uh, and it has been found that one can found uh, coronavirus uh, in the olfactory complex, in the olfactory uh, uh, nerve, uh, and also uh, in the brain areas where it goes to. So we have biological evidence that it really goes there. So now, of course, the hypothesis is that could it do something? And uh, as a neurologist, something that we are afraid is that can we have something similar as we had after the 1918 uh, Spanish flu, uh, an onset of encephalitis lethargica, uh, and also uh, an uh, increase of incident, increased incidence of uh, Parkinson's disease. And unfortunately, I am afraid that uh, uh, that uh, that may happen. At least we may have something. And for this reason, what can we do? And I can tell that European Sleep Research Society and we sleep researchers, we can do a lot because for example, RBD is one of the premonitory signs of alpha synuclein So for this reason, we are now starting this second survey where we are going to have more information on the effects of COVID-19 relative to the effects of pandemic. So we can distinguish that, is it the pandemic? Is it the isolation? What has been before? What are the risk factors and what happens by the, uh, uh, by the infection? So we ask everything that we have asked it, uh, but we include now effort sleepiness scale. And we have got permission from MAPI that we can use it freely without having to pay anything uh, for this uh, survey from uh, Murray Jones and from, uh, from, uh, from MAPI. We are also including fatigue severity scale, WHO does 2.0, because we are also interested in the autonomic nervous system uh, regulation and, and fatigue. And then we uh, have some more information about autonomic dysfunction, about suicidality, and then uh, hospitalizations, uh, duration of intensive care. We are expecting to have at least 2,000 cases of COVID uh, infections and more than 1,000 cases of post-COVID uh, uh, people with post-COVID symptoms, and hopefully even more. So this is the reason that uh, the more we are, the more we can find out. The hypotheses are uh, that RBD and sleepiness are related to COVID-19 infection, viral infection, probably through the uh, olfactory route. But also, uh, uh, and, and then another is that fatigue, on the contrary, is more related to anxiety and psychosocial effects. So we already have evidence for that, but we need proof for that. Post-traumatic uh, symptoms uh, are important. And then also that the autonomic dysfunction is present in the biological phenotype of long COVID. So it seems that we have two, at least two phenotypes of long COVID. Uh, a biological phenotype, and then we have a more like a psychosocial, biopsychosocial phenotype of uh, long COVID. 
And there, then we have a hypothesis that if somebody had poor sleep or insomnia already before COVID, uh, uh, it is a risk factor of developing COVID and it may be a risk factor of developing a more severe form of COVID. There is already some uh, evidence for that. Uh, now, what else uh, we should uh, find out are the uh, long-term effect, effects. And that is what I say. Uh, Post-COVID is very closely related to chronic fatigue syndrome, to MECFS. And, and for this reason, there is also a question in the MECFS field, can we see more patients with chronic fatigue? Uh, and the hypothesis is that, yes, unfortunately, many people will develop that. And now it is important we, that we make a difference between the biological form and the psychological form, because the treatment is very different as well. And for so far, we do not have evidence for an increase of narcolepsy type 1. One reason is genetics. We have been looking already for the uh, HLA uh, type, and uh, the 0602 uh, is, seems not to be related in any way to COVID. So, uh, but uh, of course, we don't know. Uh, but on the contrary, we may have an increase of uh, idiopathic or so-called post-COVID hypersomnia. How do we diagnose it and so on? I don't know, but uh, I'm pretty sure that we will have more cybersomnia. And certainly increase of uh, idiopathic R RBD. And if this happens, then we may uh, think that perhaps we can have an increase in alpha synecleonopathies as well. So what else is needed? So we can do a lot epidemiologically with surveys and so on, but we also need long-term clinical controlled follow-up studies with patients and controls with objective measurements of serological measurements of the COVID infection, but also sleep measurements and other measurements. We need immunogenetic studies. We also need intervention studies. Uh, and then we also need uh, studies on how to treat uh, these people with sleep disorders in the COVID times using web and so on. And this is something that I must already congratulate Dieter Riemann, who has done a tremendous work on this area in insomnia. So I think that we can do so much uh, by web uh, in helping patients with uh, uh, coronavirus. We must remember that the coronavirus has arrived to the world to stay here. So I'm sure that it will never disappear. Thank you very much. I want to especially thank Elon Americanto from University of Helsinki, a colleague of mine, who, uh, who is preparing the pilot for the second survey and, and has really a uh, primary role in that one. So everybody of you are free to use the tools, no payments. The second survey is planned to start in April, May. So please, if you want to collaborate, uh, if you want to participate, contact me or any other of the core group, and we are happy to uh, um, uh, discuss with you and, and include you in the future. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Marco. That was a terrific introduction to the topic. You really nicely summarized what we should know. And I like especially to thank you for the methodological rigor uh, uh, and, and expertise you brought into the field and for setting up this consortium. I think we will hear a lot of we will hear a lot more from this consortium. So we do not have a direct discussion. We'll have a discussion at the end, but I'd like, like to ask all of the attendees, if you have a question to Marco, please write it up and put it in the questions and answers function. We'll deal with all your questions at the end of this webinar. Marco, thank you again. So we go to our second speaker, who unfortunately is not live with us. It's the Professor Damien Léger from the University of Paris and the Hospital des Dieux. He's also a very well-known European sleep researcher and sleep medicine specialist. And he has pre-recorded his talk and he will talk about the pandemic and sleep complaints and hypnotic intake in France. So the stage is all up all uh, there for Damien Léger and uh, I think that Jennifer or Erica, you will just uh, set this in motion. Yes. Hello to everyone. Uh, very nice to be with you. Thank you for organizing this uh, meeting on sleep and COVID-19. So uh, my, my talk will be about uh, several studies we have made on the pandemics and the uh, 
focus on uh, lockdown and the impact of this lockdown on sleep complaints and uh, the uptake of new hypnotics. So I want to, to, to thank uh, the Coconel group, which is um, the group we have Focus on these kind of studies, including people from uh, everywhere in the country, and especially in the south of France, and, uh, and coordinated by Patrick Peretivatel. So the first uh, publication we have made was for the GSR, and um, it was uh, in May uh, last year. And so we focused on uh, what happened uh, around the lockdown regarding sleep complaints and hypnotics. Uh, we uh, made a first cross-sectional survey in a representative sample of the country of adults. And uh, we uh, separate uh, people and inquire about the status regarding COVID. Fortunately, most of the people had not COVID-19, but someone, some, some of them uh, had had uh, the COVID-19 with the positive PCR. And some complain of the COVID-19, but we got no PCR to, to confirm. So this survey was at the end of March um, with the fact of the lockdown entered in fo into force in France on March 17. So the question of, about sleep were very simple. So we, we got just um, some items, you know, first one was, did you have sleep problems during the last eight days? This is an item we have done for, for many studies before. Not at all, yes, a few, yes, or a lot. If yes, did they increase in the lockdown? And if yes, to the later question, did the sleeping problems and the resulting fatigue have an impact on your daily activities to, to uh, be close from the ICSD and uh, DSM definitions of insomnia? Second part, during the last 12 months, did you take sleeping pills or drug for sleep? Yes, no, or don't know. And if yes, was it before or after the lockdown? Here are the results. So uh, we were su very surprised that uh, to, to observe that about 76% of the general group said they had sleep complaints on the last eight days. So it's very important compared to previous studies we, we would see. Uh, so uh, we observe a different, significant difference between women and men. This is classical. But less classical was the fact that uh, also people under 35 had much more sleep complaints on the last eight days that the elder group compare significantly. What about sleep problems since the lockdown? Also, we were surprised to see that 54% of people complain of more sleep problems due since the lockdown. There were there was no difference for, uh, between women and men. It seems to be more important in uh, younger, but not significantly. Last uh, questions. Sleeping pills intake. Here also, we, we, we found a very high rate of sleeping pills uh, taken in the last month because we, we had 16% compared to eight or 9% generally in the French population. The difference was significantly important between women and men, 18% for, for women and 13 for men, no difference 
between each groups. And as you see, uh, about 40% of the group took sleeping pills since the lockdown, 41% of the general group, 44% of the younger group, 46% of the men. So in this study, we, we found a high rate of respondents reporting sleep complaints over the last eight days, 64%, 74%, sorry, compared to 44% in 1995 and 49 in, in 2017. Young people reported the higher the threat of sleep disorders of sleep complaint, 79%. 16% reported sleep medication in the last 12 months, and 41% since the start of the lockdown, so it was uh, really a change. We also observed that disadvantaged people claim more sleep complaints than others, about 83.1%. Uh, and COVID-19 PCR, PCR positive were 89% to report sleep problems and 52% severs. 60% of COVID-19 PCR positive, 60% took sleeping pills in the last 12 months, which is very, very important. So the second publication we have we, we want to share was uh, uh, one we, we have made in uh, sleep uh, at the end of July and uh, which concerned the association of poor sleep with the overuse, the overuse of media during the COVID lockdown. So what we, we, are, we were going to do was another cross-sectional country representative survey of uh, adults. It was also 1,005 people. We took the same sleep items, but we made the study four weeks later, between April 15 and April 17. And we uh, made, uh, two kind of media indicators. The first one was the media exposure indicator, which was built on the uh, assessment on these four items. First one, I spend a lot of time watching TV every day to learn about the epidemic. Do I strongly agree, agree, disagree? or strongly disagree. Second, every day to learn about the epidemic, I spend a lot of time reading press articles on paper or on the screen. Third one, every day to learn about the epidemic, I spend a lot of time listening to the radio. And then every day, I spend a lot of time watching videos on the internet to keep myself informed about the epidemic. So you see the score. So we, we build an indicator based on these uh, answers. And the second indicator was the fear of media exposure based on the two uh, items. The images of the epidemic that we see in the media, saturated intensive care units, evacuation of patients by helicopter, improvised morgues, etc., are often frightening me. Second one, the testimonies of caregivers and our patients they see, read in the media were often frightening. And therefore, we uh, tested the association with a simple risk ratio in blue or a multiple risk ratio in red between sleep problems and all these factors. And uh, it is uh, significant when it's clear like that, and it's not significant when it's bold. So the association with gender 
is significant. Gender with sleep problems, we have seen that. This is the same than for the first one, first study. We found also a very interesting association between sleep problems and the fact of being unemployed before the lockdown. Also, association with financial difficulties during the lockdown and association with our indicator of exposure to news and media screens, but not significantly with uh, fright induced by news media exposure. And also association between sleep problems and sleeping pain during the lockdown. Uh, uh, before the lockdown. That means that people who took sleeping pills before the lockdowns are more exposed to uh, sleep uh, problems during the lockdown. Third publication and last one today um, was in sleep medicine at the beginning of the, of the year. And uh, we inquired about would we recover better sleep at the end of the COVID-19? And we observe, we, you will uh, see a relative improvement at the population level at the end of the lockdown in France. So we made it with the same team. And the, uh, the goal was to observe the sleep complaints on four repetitive cross-sectional country representative samples of adults. So 1005, 1005, 2003, and 1736. So you have seen that the first was a sample of the first paper, the second of the second paper, and the two one. The two of the one were at the end of the of the lockdown, and one month after the end of the lockdown. And what we observed here in blue are general sleep problems, and in red, sleep problems resulting with an impact of daily activities. And you have the four survey with a progressive decreasing rate, but significantly decreased, decreased one month after the end of the COVID. That means that one month after the end of the COVID, the percentage of people complaining with sleep problems and sleep problems and impact on daily activities were significantly decreased compared to previous surveys during the lockdown or just at the end of the lockdown. When we see males and females, younger people and elder, uh, we, we see the same tendencies, but no significant differences between males and females and between young and elder. So in conclusion, we, we see that sleep uh, has been deeply impacted by lockdown in France during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is uh, clear. To cope with sleep problems, uh, young and vulnerable people and people who got the disease uh, had often no choice except hypnotics and the misuse of medias, misuse of medias, no possibility to, to get sport, no possibility to get um, some, some other kind of therapy. So poor sleep was probably a crucial factor in the development of anxiety and depressive disorders uh, that has been described as the COVID-19 second wave, and uh, which are very important actually in our country and in uh, other countries also. So in, in the future, uh, we will probably have to understand how lockdown may have promoted post-traumatic disorders in uh, the adult population of uh, our countries. So thank you very much for, for your attention. I would like to, to uh, thank uh, my uh, whole team for the contribution. You see my team, Vivasom, Université de Paris, Hôtel Dieu, APHP, 
and naturally uh, the coconut uh, group with uh, especially my co-authors who are uh, associated to all these three papers who are Patrick Peretivetter, uh, Lisa Fressa, Sebastien Cortaredona, and Pierre Verger, François Beck, and thank you very much to, to all the team. Thank you for, uh, for your attention and uh, good meeting. I'd like to thank Damien for this great talk. Uh, again, uh, a really highly interesting data and I liked especially that he had several waves of investigation over the last year, which results in a lot of uh, new information. So Damien is not with us, but nevertheless, if you have any questions relating to his talk, please put your questions in the questions and answers chat function. We'll try to deal with your questions at the end of this webinar. Okay, so we can go to the next speaker. And now we go from, we started with Finland, we were in France, and now we go to Italy, we go to uh, uh, Padova, the University of Padova. It's a pleasure for me to, inter to introduce uh, Nicola Cellini, who is an assistant professor of psychology at the University of Padova. And he's gonna talk about uh, the COVID-19 lockdown in Italy, impact on sleep pattern, sense of time, and digital media use. Dear Nicola, we are looking very much forward to your talk. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the, um, okay, let's check if you can hear me. I guess so. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, the COVID-19 lockdown in Italy. And uh, what I wanted to tell you is that uh, one year ago, at the beginning of March, Italy was the first country, the first Western country to deal with the COVID-19 situation. Uh, at the beginning of March, we had roughly um, 10,000 cases of, uh, of COVID-19 and 1,000 deaths due to COVID-19 and these numbers will dramatically increase over the next few weeks. So at the, um, on 10 of March, the Italian government decided for an Italian lockdown, a national lockdown, which lasted uh, up to the 4th of May. And during this lockdown, what happened was that um, the, all the schools were closed, all the non-essential shops were closed, and people were forced to work remotely. So, this means that people couldn't go out of home, and so there was a kind of a home confinement. So if on, on the one hand, uh, this was really important to reduce the transmission of the virus, on the one hand, the, this res restriction had a huge impact on physically, on the physically uh, and mental well-being of people. So people uh, confined at home um, experienced a reduced exposure to sunlight. They couldn't go out of their house. At the same time, they experienced a reduced physical activity. So they couldn't even go out for jogging or to, to run. And of course, there was a, a big change in daily routine. Think about not going to work in the morning or to take care of your children 24 hours a day. Also, uh, this, res this restriction imposed a, um, a lack of face-to-face -face interaction. So people couldn't um, talk in face beside people living in the same house. And at the time we were expected an increased level of stress, fear, anxiety, and depression. So what uh, all these, these changes uh, add have an impact on sleep. So at the time we wanted to, to have a snapshot uh, about uh, what happened on sleep pattern during the lockdown. So we decided to run a study and this study was focused mainly on, on sleep quality, quantity and timing during the lockdown. Uh, the study was conducted with my colleagues from the University of Padua, Natale Canale and Giovanna Mioni and Sebastian Costa from the University of Campania. And we were looking at what happened at the level of sleep quality, how people slept during the, the lockdown, uh, how much they slept, uh, at what time they, they 
started to go to bed and wake up in the morning. And then we focus our attention on the psychological distress. So the level of stress, anxiety, and depression. We were, we were also interested in our, the use of digital media. So um, people would increase the use of digital media before going to bed. Lastly, we were really interested on the time experience. So how the feeling of the passage of time would change during the lockdown. So we built a survey. This survey was um, conducted between the 24th and the 28th of March. So the, during the third week of lockdown in Italy, and all the questions were referred to the previous week, so the second week of lockdown and the first week of February. So before the lockdown started in Italy. In this first study, we target people uh, age 18 to 35 because we were really interested in use of digital media and the literature usually is referring on this age group. We collected roughly 1,300 participants. So I'm gonna go through the data. And what you can see here is the sleep timing uh, before the lockdown in, in orange bar and during the lockdown in the blue bars in workers and students. What you can, it's easy to see is that for all the participants, there was a shift, a delay in sleep time. People tend to go to bed 40 minutes later than before the lockdown and wake up about one hour later. And this was true for both workers and students, but for workers, the uh, rise time delay, so the time they woke up in the morning was really delayed uh, more than one hour. And this is likely due to the fact they didn't have to commute to go to work, uh, or if they had to go to work outside the house, there was no traffic on the road. So there was a big change in sleep timing. But what about sleep quantity? Uh, what we can see here, there is, in general, there is an increase of time spent in bed. So people, didn't, they didn't have to wake up in the morning to go to work, so they could spend more time in bed. And this was particularly true for workers who spent uh, roughly 40 minutes more on bed uh, during the lockdown than before the lockdown. However, um, participants also spend more time trying to fall asleep, roughly five minutes on average. Uh, so there was a uh, longer sleep latency. But what about sleep quality? So the quality here is basically how people perceive their sleep. And on the left panel, what you can see here is a score of a questionnaire. And the higher is the score, poorer is the sleep quality of the person. What you can see here is that for both students and workers, sleep quality uh, get worse during the lockdown. And on the right panel, you can see the proportion or participant who reported uh, a poor sleep as defined by the cutoff of the questionnaire we use. Basically, from the uh, period before the lockdown to the lockdown, there was a change from 40% of the people who we could define as poor sleeper to 53%. So half of our sample experienced, experienced poor sleep during the lockdown. Next, we look at stress, anxiety, and depression. And what you can see here on the, on the left side, on the left graph, is the proportion of participants with a moderate to severe symptoms of depression, anxiety, and stress. And these numbers are pretty high, actually. And on the right, you can see that uh, worse was the sleep quality change during the lockdown, higher was the level of depression, the level of stress, and the level of anxiety. So people, uh, participants with higher level of anxiety, stress, and depression were also the one with a, a, a stronger change in sleep quality, so they slept worse during the lockdown. But what about the use of digital media? So uh, with participants to read the number of activities done in the two hours before going to bed, and what you can see here that during the lockdown, participants spent more time and did more activity uh, before going to bed, 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 sorry, during the lockdown, then before the lockdown. However, when we try to, to associate this change in the media usage with the sleep pattern and during the lockdown, what we could, could find was just mildly association. So there was, yes, an increased use of 
digital media was associated with later bad time, but this association was not so strong. And the same was for midpoint of sleep and sleep quality. What about time experiences? So during the lockdown, people had more difficulties to keep track of time. So they were often confused about what day of the week was, what hour of the day was, and so on. At the same time, they felt that the time was expanding. So the time was moving slower during the lockdown than before the lockdown. Also, they had difficulties here in schedule to, to, to have a regular schedule in terms of meal time, sleep time, and so on. And what you can see here is that, uh, for example, uh, increased sleep difficulties were associated with the feeling of spending time and uh, less, were, uh, less regular were the schedules and later was the bedtime. So all these variables were associated between them. Then we recheck our data to see if there was any differences between, uh, between genres. Uh, the speaker before me uh, mentioned uh, several reports uh, show, are showing that women were the one who uh, most affected by, by the pandemic situation. And we actually show the same. So this is the proportion of poor sleepers before the lockdown and during the lockdown. And usually female were the one with the higher proportion of sleep difficulties. And during the lockdown, this increase was higher than males. At the same time, females were the one with the higher level of depression, anxiety, and stress during the lockdown. Then we decided to try to replicate this data. A few weeks later, we ran a second survey, this time in collaboration with the University of Campania and the University of Liège. And basically, this time we target the general population between 18 and 80 years old. And we collect data in Italy, roughly 1,600 participants, and in Belgium, so about 600 participants. And again, what we can see here is that even in the second study, you can see a marked shift in sleep timing. People went to bed later during the lockdown than before the lockdown. And this was regardless of the time of job we are doing at the time. So even people unemployed or people who were forced to stop working during the, the pandemic, or students or people who were working remotely. The only one who showed uh, less change were people who were forced to go uh, to work outside their house. So for example, uh, healthcare uh, workers or people working on grocery shops. Even in this case, what you can see here, are the people uh, wake up later and uh, during the lockdown than before, again, likely due to, uh, for example, uh, less traffic on the roads. So what about the sleep quality? We again replicate the previous data. So people had a lower sleep quality during the, during the uh, lockdown than before the lockdown. And the proportion, again, increased from about 40% to 54%, and female, the females were the one with the higher proportion of sleep difficulty compared to males. So another set of analysis shows us that the people more at risk of sleep problems were women, young adults, people with moderate to severe level of stress and fear related to the pandemic situation and with a low mood. And these results were strikingly similar in Italy and in Belgium. Just to conclude, Overall, this data related to the first lockdown in Italy has shown that people experienced a delayed sleep timing, about one hour. They spent more time in bed, but at the same time, they felt that their sleep were worse than before the lockdown, and this was particularly true for women. They experienced a high level of psychological distress, and although they increased the use of digital media before going to bed, this increase was mildly associated with sleep pattern. They also experienced a very uh, altered experience of time. So uh, their experience of time was distorted. And remarkably, data, these data are consistent across studies within Italy and between countries, as uh, the data showed before by uh, Professor Leger. Now, I want just to conclude the thanking all the collaborators of these studies. Okay, I think. I'm done.
Yeah, Nicola, thank you very much for the work you did in Italy and also in Belgium for the several studies you performed. And I'd like to congratulate you on the exciting data and results you, you uh, shared with us now. But as I said before, there'll be a general discussion at the end of this webinar. So if any of the attendees has a question, comment to Nicola, please put it uh, in the question and answers function and we'll deal with it later on. Okay, we stay in Italy. We stay in Italy. Our next speaker will be Valentina Alfonso. She's Alfonsi, sorry. She's from uh, uh, University of Rome, La Sapienza. And I think she's, you're still a PhD student or you already accomplished your PhD? No, I am a postdoctoral researcher. Ah, postdoc, wonderful, great. And we're really excited to hear about data you collected in uh, Italy. And you'll be dealing with the nightmares the pandemic gave us. Valentina, we are looking forward to your talk. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm Valentina Alfonsi. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Laboratory of Sleep Psychophysiology in Sapienza University of Rome. Today, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, our recent study on the effects uh, of the COVID-19 on dream activity conducted in collaboration with uh, many universities and institutions in our country. COVID-19 critically impacted the world uh, and clearly also our daily and sleep routine. Uh, since the very beginning of the COVID-19 lockdown, uh, we observed uh, an interesting phenomenon all over the world. In particular, People spontaneously report uh, more frequent, uh, vivid, uh, and emotional dreams uh, on the websites uh, or social media platforms. And uh, we should also remember that the pandemic experience uh, could be considered uh, a traumatic event, as reflected uh, by the higher proportion of PTSD-like symptoms uh, during this period in Italy and in other countries. All this is in line with the previous studies that showed changes of dreams and nightmares as a consequences of adverse events, such as, for example, wars, infectious disease, or earthquake. To date, studies directly investigated the effects of the pandemic on dream quality and quantity are very scarce. And here in the summary table, we briefly present some interesting results from recent studies, consistently showing that during lockdown, we observed an increased dream frequency, more emotional charge, and in particular, negative emotional tone in dreams, more virus-related contents, and specific predictors of such modifications which are mainly female gender, psychological distress, and poor sleep quality. In particular, we had the three main goals in this study. Uh, first of all, we aim to assess whether Italian people actually had higher dream and nightmare frequency during the pandemic by comparing with a normative sample. Then we aim to identify the specific predictors of dream and nightmare frequency during lockdown by investigating the social demographic and COVID related aspects, but also considering psychological symptoms and sleep measures. Finally, we aim to evaluate emotional features of dreams and nightmares in different subgroups uh, divided according to COVID-related aspects. We hypothesize that the radical changes in daily life routine and their uh, related aspects widely impact dream activity, uh, especially increasing nightmare frequency and uh, emotional contents and charge of dreams. We selected for this study uh, all the Italian adult subjects, 
resulting in a final sample of 5,988 subjects. Each participant completed a web-based survey. The survey was available during the Italian lockdown period and uh, each subject was previously informed about the nature of the study and all personal data was anonymized. Uh, data reported in the current study were part of a wider project and other results uh, were presented elsewhere. The web form was composed of four sections and each section collected specific measures. The first part was about uh, the social demographic information, for example, gender, age, education, occupation, and uh, COVID related information, such as COVID positivity, modification of daily and sleep habits, or having relatives or friends affected or diseased from COVID. The other sections refer to specific and well-known scales and questionnaires to assess psychological symptoms by the depression, uh, anxiety, stress scales, sleep measures collected by the medical outcomes study sleep scale. And um, in particular, we considered a global sleep problem index and information about sleep duration and uh, intrasleep wakefulness. We also assess the dream variables uh, by the man named dream questionnaire. And here we focused on items regarding dream recall and nightmare frequency, dream emotional intensity, dream emotional tone and nightmare distress. Here we can see uh, the result about the first goal of the study, that is the comparison of dream and nightmare frequency between normative sample here in yellow and pandemic sample in blue. Specifically, uh, the figure showed the distribution of scores on a Likert scale about dream recall frequency in the upper and nightmare frequency in the bottom. Statistical comparison by key square tests show different distribution of scores in the two groups for both dream measures. In particular, uh, bar plots describe higher scores for dream recall and nightmare frequency in pandemic sample compared to normative sample. Uh, another relevant research question was about the predictors of high and low dream frequency. And here we can see the logistic regression model on dream recall frequency, showing that uh, younger age, female gender, not having children and higher sleep duration were all predictors of higher dream recall frequency. In this other figure, we can see the same regression analysis on predictors of nightmare frequency, which are in this case younger age, female gender, modification of daytime napping, higher intrasleep wakefulness, higher sleep duration, sleep problems, and anxiety and depression symptoms. Finally, we can see from this table the emotional features, in particular emotional intensity, emotional tone, and nightmare distress in different subgroups affecting or not by COVID-related aspects. Uh, we compared all different groups by the test. Specifically, we uh, observed uh, higher emotional features of dream activity in uh, workers uh, who have stopped their jobs, in uh, people uh, uh, having uh, relatives uh, or friends uh, infected or diseased from COVID, and in subjects uh, who changed their sleep habits, in particular sleep onset, uh, morning awakenings, uh, and daytime napping. So the first relevant result of the current study 
show an increased dream recall and nightmare frequency as compared with a normative sample under normative condition. And we could explain these results considering that uh, nightmares and dreams could represent uh, an attempt to process stressful events by specific memory mechanisms. And consistently, many studies have demonstrated that uh, after experiencing traumatic or stressful events, uh, dreams underwent significant changes in their occurrence. We also identified the predictors of dream and nightmare frequency during the lockdown, confirming higher dreams and nightmares in female gender and young age, as observed in previous studies. Uh, while surprisingly, having children was negatively associated with dream recall frequency, despite having children uh, was considered as possible stressor during this period. However, we have not uh, any information about ages or number of children, which could explain such uh, unexpected result. We also found uh, that poor sleep, in particular sleep problems and uh, intra-sleep wakefulness, predict uh, nightmare frequency. And this is in keeping with the arousal retrieval model, which stated that dream recall may be promoted by awakenings during sleep and by the resulting sleep fragmentation. Within uh, this theoretical framework, uh, the predictive role of longer sleep duration for uh, dream recall and nightmare frequency may appear contradictory. However, we should consider that sleep timing uh, were strongly affected by the home confinement and longer sleep duration during lockdown has been associated to lighter and more fragmented sleep. Finally, higher level of anxiety and depressive symptoms lead to more unpleasant dreams. And this is in line with the role of dreams in emotional processes and with the hypothesis of dreaming as coping strategy during stressful events and life changes. And then we found higher emotional features in terms of intensity, tone and distress of dream activity in people most affected by the pandemic. We explain such results with the fact that negative events and emotions during lockdown could be uh, incorporated in sleep mentation, in line with the well-known hypothesis of continuity between wake and sleep, sleep processes. We collected data from a very large uh, Italian sample, uh, but we uh, also have to mention some limitation in this study. For example, we did not collect dream report, uh, and so we cannot directly assess the continuity between waking experiences and the actual dream contents. Also, the information about sleep quality is not supported by objective uh, or systematic measures such as, for example, actigraphic recordings or sleep diaries and so on. Moreover, we have not any information about psychological treatment, uh, pharmacological treatment, which may affect uh, sleep and dreaming. Finally, we have not a real baseline in this study, which could have been informative about the pre-pandemic condition. And this aspect limits our understanding about the causal relationship between pandemic and changes in dream activity. In conclusion, our results are in line with the evidence of a strong influence of traumatic collective experiences on phenomenology of dream activity. We also confirm and extend the results of previous studies that showed uh, an increased frequency and emotional charge of dreams and nightmares uh, during the pandemic. 
And uh, our results uh, are also in line with the well-known uh, continuity hypothesis and uh, arousal retrieval model, pointing out uh, the influence of psychological distress and sleep problems, uh, respectively, on dream aspects. Finally, we suggest that uh, future investigations uh, should monitor the changes uh, in dreams and nightmares across the pandemic. Also considering the implications for clinical treatment and prevention of mental and sleep disorders. Thank you very much for your attention. Dear Valentina, <clears throat> I'd like to thank you for sharing your data with us. I think it was really very important to have in this webinar, not just data on what happens to sleep and sleep disturbances, but also talk about to talk about the psychological side, about the dream side and the nightmare side and the effects the pandemic had on set. So as said before, if there are any questions, comments to Valentina, put them in the questions and answers function and we'll deal with it at the end of this symposium. And we are almost approaching the end. We are approaching our last speaker and I'm very happy to welcome Elemara Altena, uh, originally from the Netherlands uh, and now working in Bordeaux for quite a few years. She's a PhD and associate professor and she works on the Noro campus and she's gonna present us uh, a few ideas which were published in Journal of Sleep Research about how to deal with sleep problems due to the crisis. LMRI, where uh, our attention is all yours. Thank you, Dieter. So just, okay. So um, yeah, so thank you for that introduction. I will talk a little bit about the paper that uh, we wrote on how to deal uh, with sleep problems uh, during COVID. Uh, so a little introduction of the background of that paper. So cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is actually based on changing those sleep disrupting thoughts and ideas and behavior that we know are underlying insomnia. And so typically that is then being treated uh, in about four to eight weeks at one-to-one -one sessions. Uh, and that is together called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And it's known for many uh, clinical trials that is actually much more effective than medication alone. Also on follow-up, if people are being followed up three to six months uh, after treatment, uh, they usually still are without uh, insomnia symptoms. And so in 2016-17, a number of European and North American experts uh, decided, well, actually, based on all those clinical trials that have been done, uh, we can now decide that cognitive behavioral therapy is really the gold standard for treating insomnia, and it should actually be accessible to all insomnia patients. And so when they had decided that, um, later on, just reviewing uh, the evidence of what was coming out, uh, they actually also decided that it was still not accessible enough. So a number of papers were written about that, uh, despite those recommendations made. And so that was the basis of the European CBTI Academy that was founded in 2018, initiative by uh, Dieter Riemann. Um, and so there, the aim uh, for the CBTI Academy was to actually make cognitive behavioral therapy more accessible to insomnia patients and also increase uh, the number of clinicians uh, that can give CBTI throughout Europe and establish also uh, teaching courses. And so uh, while we were working on that and we'd written a paper on that, uh, this happened, uh, March 2020, the other speakers have mentioned it. Uh, we went into a uh, total lockdown, first in Italy and Spain, then in France. Uh, and then uh, particularly also in France, we needed the uh, attestation de déplacement des rogatoires, just meaning we had to sign a form to uh, leave the house for one hour max, uh, a day, one kilometer max. So that had major impacts on our physical activity, daily light, et cetera. So um, as an academy, we were wondering what if this situation, you already have insomnia, or what if you are at high risk to develop insomnia? Uh, so for those people that are usually lying awake at nights already uh, before a stressful event or after a stressful event uh, that are suffering from so-called uh, high sleep reactivity, what is happening to those people right now? 
So we decided to adapt the existing CBT strategies that we know are effective to, gi to give as fast as possible some relevant sleep advice to those people in uh, this special situation. And so with a team of experts on CBTI for chronic and acute insomnia and sleep treatment in children, uh, as well as experts on sleep medication and epidemiology of insomnia, we wrote this paper uh, very fast, as, much, as fast as possible. And uh, with some help of the journal of sleep research, uh, we could actually um, publish it uh, in April 2020. And so in the, in the paper, we actually um, it first introduced uh, what we know about the stress sleep link and how stress can affect uh, nighttime sleep and vice versa. Uh, what we knew at the time, which was not so much about how confinement uh, can affect sleep and particularly uh, affecting the homeostasis and uh, circadian rhythms. Uh, also about the known CPDI mechanisms that through sleep restriction, we can actually bring up the sleep drive uh, and sleep pressure to sleep better. What is known about breaking through hyperarousal, this sort of uh, low level stress that affects both nighttime sleep and daytime functioning. Uh, and what we know, for instance, from uh, the sleep horm hormone uh, melatonin and how we need daylight to suppress that during the day. And then we also uh, talked about what we knew at the time uh, very early on about some of these first studies coming out, particularly of China, uh, that uh, we saw it also in other talks from uh, European results. Uh, more than three hours news exposure about COVID would actually affect your sleep. It's mostly younger people that would be affected next to uh, women. And that if you actually share uh, with all your worries and your thoughts and your anxieties about this uh, particular situation, it does actually help you sleep better at night. So uh, we wrote the introduction around that and then we followed it up with those uh, adapted um, tips to sleep better uh, during confinement. So, of course, uh, as a normal CBTI advice, it would be keeping a regular ske a schedule about waking up and going to bed at night. Uh, but in particular, also bright morning light. And of course, if you are, uh, if you have to stay at home, it's much harder. Uh, so we were recommending people that if they really couldn't get any daylight, uh, try to do with artificial light for melatonin suppression, uh, keep with some home-based exercises to, uh, to stay fit and to keep that day and night rhythm a bit in place, uh, limit news exposure, particularly in the evening before going to sleep, uh, get a rumination moment. That's standard, you know, CBTI uh, advice, but we really try to adapt. Like if you do have to stay inside the whole day with the whole family, try to do that in a little separate space, spend some time stressing and worrying during the day about everything that's going on. So it wouldn't uh, disrupt your nighttime sleep. And of course, with children, organize uh, conversations during the day to, to limit their uh, anxiety, prevent nightmares, as we saw plays a very important role. Um, and of course, if you have a, a room like this uh, in the middle down picture, and you have a sofa that is a bed at night and you live in a small apartment, uh, make that uh, association still positive and change even just a different blanket for day and night to really uh, keep that specific function for the bed and keep a uh, positive association. And then, of course, very important social interaction, particularly during the day, sharing those worries and stressful thoughts uh, that we knew already would enhance uh, good sleep. Um, and then we also wanted to share maybe uh, at the time we didn't know that would work out, but maybe some possible benefits of lockdown uh, for some people uh, that could, for instance, in adolescence, uh, actually respect more their natural wake and sleep rhythm. If they didn't have to uh, get up very early to go to school, uh, start a bit later, uh, go to bed a bit later, sleep a bit more. Uh, and that, of course, would also go for uh, morning and evening types. And of course, people that are usually commuting a lot or traveling a lot, maybe spend a bit more time and use that time to uh, enjoy with the family a bit, which of course only uh, would go for a number of people. So yeah, so through this fast track uh, publication option, we could actually publish this the 4th of April uh, and it made it open access uh, thanks to the journal Sleep Research. So it was accessible to all um, to take advantage from. And fortunately, it was picked up uh, quite fast internationally. And a lot of these tips got translated and published on websites uh, so people could read it. And so these are just some examples from Brazil, Spain, uh, Italy, and the United States, uh, where it was picked up and um, brought under people's attention. So that was great. 
Um, but despite all our uh, wonderful efforts, I think, um, it, there was still, as we saw also in the previous talks, a major uh, increase in the prevalence of insomnia. So we looked at uh, a lot of the papers that come out. As you saw, there were there's many uh, coming out. And within those papers, uh, we looked at those papers that apply the formal criteria for insomnia, so DSM-5 diagnosis or uh, insomnia severity index of more than seven. So this is work by uh, my student, Estelle Bouquet. And then we looked at those papers that have been published already applying those formal criteria on uh, insomnia prevalence. And it looks like this. So this is just uh, some of the examples. Here you can see that before COVID, and so these are studies that have been done way before COVID uh, based on those uh, criteria. Uh, prevalence was about 10 to 20%, as we know is, is uh, normal for insomnia. And you see that even within each of these countries, prevalence uh, went up to about 40, 50%, uh, with some differences, but an overall trend of major increase in prevalence of insomnia. So this is not all sleep problems, this is just insomnia. And this actually goes with uh, other data. So for instance, this is a, a paper published by uh, Jeremy et al. that shows that those people that are actually having COVID-19 have about 75% have uh, sleep problems. Of course, also, also strongly related to respir respiratory problems as we saw before, but also high prevalences in healthcare workers and the general population. And this is another paper showing those differences between countries. And again, there are uh, differences uh, per country, but overall 30% of people sleep worse and only 50% indicates they sleep a little bit better. Um, and so if you ask then, so why do people do sleep worse? So this is a, a paper of Mandelkorn uh, that appeared in 2021. Uh, you can actually see some of those effects that we saw also in the previous talks about uh, effects of stress on sleep. Uh, people say, I fall asleep later, I wake more up during the day. When I actually wake up, it's much harder to go back to sleep. And so these are those typical effects of stress that we know affect sleep. Uh, and then people feel more tired during the day and uh, more unrefreshed. So even if they would sleep longer, uh, they feel worse uh, waking up in the next day. And that might just be that effect of stress uh, intervening with sleep. And so um, not all news is bad. So those possible benefits that we thought uh, would be an effect of this lockdown were shown in some of these papers. Uh, so this was published in journal of sleep research uh, by a Chinese group that showed that children between four and six years old, they actually slept longer and, and showed fewer sleep disturbances as uh, reported by their parents. Uh, this is a study from uh, Germany Switzerland and Austria that actually also shows that people sleep longer and the same in Argentina. But those studies also show that uh, people complain more about sleep quality and there are, there are concerns about the possible disruption of chronotype uh, with, that are mentioned in these same uh, studies. So what we know from insomnia is that if a stressful event happens and it's actually resolved, so it's, it's not uh, current anymore, usually insomnia is there to stay. Um, so this is uh, where uh, we have a new task ahead of us. Um, so if you look at what is there to stay, this is a study uh, that was published recently. This is uh, published in The Lancet 2021. And uh, I found a, a similar study actually by another group in 2020 um, that actually shows that if you look at those patients that have been hospitalized uh, because of COVID-19 and you follow them up after hospital discharge, so after they went home, uh, three to six months later, so this is uh, in uh, blue is six months later and in uh, orange is three months later, you actually see a very, very high uh, percentage of them still suffer from fatigue and also uh, sleep problems. So 30% uh, in the highest of uh, these studies. And that is actually a higher percentage in both of these uh, studies than anxiety and depression. So this is again, people who had COVID went to the hospital and were followed up after. And so if you looked at the publications that came out, if you just type insomnia and COVID-19 in PubMed, there's fortunately, I'd say a lot of attention for sleep problems uh, in this particular situation, 369 results. 
But then if you compare that to common behavioral therapy, uh, there's 12. And uh, there's only a few of those 12 uh, that now show results. So there's a task ahead of us. I just want to emphasize some of those studies that do uh, show results. So this is a study by um, a group of Philip Cheng, and they've actually given CBTI before COVID, so to 2016, 2017, and they managed to follow these people up um, afterwards. And they showed that those the group that received the CBTI uh, before, they actually developed less insomnia and less stress and depression during uh, this pandemic and during the lockdown situation, everything that uh, came at them in terms of stress. And they also had a better score on general health compared to a group that was just uh, given sleep education. So we just informed a few things about sleep. Uh, so that's a very promising result, I think, for where we can be headed uh, with CPTI. Uh, and then there is two studies uh, also from Europe. So this is a study uh, by the group of Angelika Schlarp that shows a small pilot study, but it's done in university staff. And if they have actually treated uh, these people with uh, digital CBTI, it was a self-learning program. They saw during uh, the pandemic a 78% uh, reduced sleep problems of which a, a good number was clini clinically uh, significant. And then from the same group, they had a pilot study in children where uh, also 67% of children uh, showed reduced sleep problems through an online cognitive behavioral therapy program. So it shows that even if you do apply digital and online forms of cognitive behavioral therapy can really work uh, before and during uh, COVID times. Okay, so I would like to, uh, to wrap up by saying that I think uh, I've shown you despite all of our efforts that maybe helped a little bit, um, but still insomnia is unfortunately skyrocketing in, in COVID times. Uh, and it's likely to become a chronic problem without proper treatment. We also show some hopeful studies that uh, CBTI can prevent health and psychiatric problems also in COVID times, and that those adaptations of the classical one-to-one -one CBTI where a therapist is in a room with a patient that are now being done by Zoom and Skype and through websites, uh, to apps and by, for instance, single shot CBTI uh, for acute insomnia or situational insomnia can actually really help and maybe also uh, to disseminate CBTI uh, in insomnia. And in particular, that is for mild to moderate insomnia. So severe insomnia would still uh, strong, strongly recommend to uh, visit a physician uh, for treatment. So um, here lies a task ahead of us as a CBTI Academy, but I think in general for all uh, sleep clinicians uh, to treat more insomnia patients, especially now, as we see uh, with these higher numbers overall, making CBTI more accessible throughout Europe through many forms. And then we will continue also to credit those existing and new courses to train more CBTI therapists to make it uh, more accessible. So I wanna end by thanking you very much for this invitation and this interesting symposium. Yeah. Elemara, thank you very much for your excellent talk. I think it was the ideal finish for this webinar to talk about practical aspects, how to deal with uh, uh, aspects of insomnia during the epidemic. So what I will do now, we have a few minutes left and I don't think we have to stop at 3.30 sharp. There are questions, uh, uh, some questions here. Some of them have already been directly answered. There are two technical issues which are raised here. One is, will there be a certificate? And no, there will be no certificate because this was not planned as a CME activity, but really as an open to the public seminar, but we'll think about that in the future for this series of uh, events. And the second question is, will it be possible to view the talks afterwards? Yes, it will be possible. Everything has been recorded and it, it will be available through the website of the ESRS, the European Sleep Research Society. And uh, Jennifer or Erica, if this is not right, correct me. Will it be available through the website of the ESRS? I assume yes. Peter, yes, it will be available. And um, to what extent and where exactly, we're gonna figure out based on the size of the recording, but yes. Okay, but watch out for the ESRS website. There are many questions which have already been answered. And I just try to pick out those which I think which are very important for the, for the general uh, um, um, opinion here. There's one question. What about narcolepsy after COVID vaccination? Any surveys 
planned. And I think, Marco, that's probably you are the ideal person to answer this question. You already answered it in written, but maybe you can comment on it. Yes, for the vaccines, we have been carefully looking for that. Uh, no reason to be afraid. The coronavirus is very different from uh, influenza viral as concerns uh, proteins and, and the viral structure. Uh, so uh, the, theoretically, the only one that may have some rules is the uh, CSK Sanofi vaccine, which includes the AS03 adjuvant, but it is uh, just uh, starting the phase three trial, so it's not on the market. So any of the vaccines on the market, uh, Pfizer, uh, BioNTech, uh, uh, Moderna, uh, AstraZeneca, uh, the Sputnik, uh, the Chinese vaccines, they are all safe. No reason to be afraid. May another question to you, Marku. What about the role of melatonin uh, uh, as a medicine? to be used during COVID-19. Can you say a few words about that? That's really yes, yes, this is very, very good question. I, I certainly, I, I do not know. Theoretically, it may be good because it's an antioxidant, uh, many beneficial issues. It may help you to keep the uh, uh, chronobiological rhythm. But I'm putting this question to the audience and to the others. Does anybody have biological evidence or biological knowledge that would it be, could there be some risks? In my opinion, it no risks. It may be even beneficial, but to be honest, I really don't know. So if somebody can answer, please do. Yeah, they put it in the question and answers function. There's a question to Nicola about what are the risk factors for worse sleep for women during lockdown? Is it related to having children? Was it related to having children? Okay, this is a huge question and uh, probably I don't have the, the, the final answer. But I can say that at least in Italy, uh, there are several factors that, uh, that should be taken into account. First of all, the prevalence of uh, sleep difficulties and psychiatric distress just before the lockdown. And the reason for that is another it could be an, another old conference. But then during the lockdown in Italy, women were the one who lost most of the jobs in Italy. So there was a financial issue for women. 90% of the job lost in Italy were women. And the other thing is related to home care, child care. Uh, basically, the few reports have already shown what we already knew, that in Italy, most of the child care is, was on the shoulder of women. So all these factors like push women to uh, have a lot to deal with and likely are some of the factors that uh, they push for this increase in sleep difficulties during the lockdown. This is just a partial answer. I don't have the whole picture, but- uh, Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. There is uh, another general question. Um, to Nicola, what, what, what was the most important component of the pesky that contributed to poor sleep quality? Okay, I'm just going to, to like, uh, I don't actually remember the numbers, but usually what we could see is that, um, of course, the subjective, the subjective uh, sleep quality was uh, showing a, a large change from before the lockdown to, to, to the lockdown, the use of medication, and in general, the, the question related to the sleep disturbances. So the frequency to fall to wake up during the night, the difficulty to falling asleep and so on. So these are the main uh, components of the PSKI that show the bigger change. Yeah, there's a question I think, which Ellen, Ellen Murray probably can answer very well. The question is how helpful can physical activity be? What, what's the role of physical activity? at what time of day in order to counteract COVID-related sleep problems? Okay, so we know from uh, CBTI and in general uh, theories on uh, mechanisms of insomnia that if that physical activity can uh, help uh, in, in many ways, obviously uh, you will get more uh, daylight, which, uh, which promotes uh, melatonin suppression. Uh, physical activity in the morning can really help you to start the day for those people that may suffer from sleep inertia where uh, the brain is still not fully awake yet. Uh, and it can also help for body temperature regulation. So if, um, if you actually do uh, physical activity in about two hours uh, or a bit earlier before you want to go to sleep, it sort of warms up the core temperature of your body, which is then disseminated to the uh, uh, to the uh, periphery uh, of your body, and then you, that will actually give you the 
the, the ideal body temperature to fall asleep, uh, ideally. So that all of those things are usually incorporated in uh, treatment for insomnia uh, for a particular uh, type of patients. And yeah, because that was very restricted. Uh, and of course, also to reduce stress. It's a, it can be a major uh, uh, component that can help to reduce stress. So this is why we integrated all that also in the advice for people that had to stay at home to at least do uh, some home-based physical activity. Thank you, Erima. Uh, I have a question to Valentina. Have you any idea, uh, you showed, nicely showed us this increase, increase in dream recall frequency and in nightmares. Are there any practical recommendations you have for people really suffering from nightmares during these times? Are there any ideas what they could do in order to uh, um, counteract their nightmares? Uh, thank you for the question. I have no uh, in, uh, answer, but I think that uh, nightmares in these periods uh, and also dreams uh, could represent a sort of coping strategy that uh, help us cope uh, with negative events and stressful situation. But uh, about the treatment, uh, um, I, I can give you uh, an exact uh, answer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I, we have a last question for Marco. What, Marco, what could be the pathways involved in changes in REM sleep in patients who were infected with COVID-19? Well, actually, yeah, this is an excellent question. This is one of our hypotheses. So we have evidence that the coronavirus goes to the olfactory nerve in more than 40% of the cases. And there is evidence that it really goes to, uh, until the uh, hypothalamus uh, and uh, into the, uh, including the orexin cells. So this is what we think that in some persons, unfortunately, they may go uh, and uh, do even some uh, uh, destruction some, uh, somewhere. Uh, difficult to say, um, uh, but there may be something. I will give one re excellent reference on the whole aspect. And that is a reference of uh, Stephen Porges. Uh, uh, some of you may know it, Stephen Porges from Harvard writing about the double way color system and uh, and covid because it also seems that the that the, the virus may go to uh, to uh, nucleus ambiguous uh, and in that way it may also be related to some of the emotional issues and and and, and such issues so uh, probably there is a biological pathway we need to find for that uh, if Pierre Herve is uh, listening, I hope you hear me, Pierre Herve, perhaps your group could uh, start to study that. Uh, if you have evidence about the viral going to the uh, centers regulating sleep wake. Thank you, Marco. Maybe Pierre Herve, do you want to comment on that? I, don't, I mean, of course, I, I, I thought a bit about that. Uh, yeah, it would, be, uh, it would be something interesting to look at uh, What's happening in the brain uh, with the diffusion of the virus, the activation of neurons, and so on. But this is this is a, a very, uh, I mean, huge task. If, uh, and I don't know if somebody at the moment is looking at that. Besides sleep, of course, it's uh, more general. Uh, if uh, if there is some effect on neurons, I, I believe it's uh, of course an interesting topic. Uh, Pierre Hervé, could you? I, 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 it may be difficult to have uh, the virus uh, inject into the nose and then uh, looking what happens uh, uh, in experimental animals. Well, I imagine it's possible. Yeah, you, you can do that for sure. Of course, you need to control what you are doing, right? You don't. I cannot. To... I cannot do it. I cannot do it. You may. <laughs> okay, let's let's talk about that. I, I don't know if there are some groups trying to do that, but it's an interesting topic for sure. Yeah. So I think that was a, a good uh, solution and, and, and final word to a webinar here from our president, the president of the ESRS, Pierre Hervé-Lup. So I'd like to end our webinar. First of all, I'd like to thank again the European Sleep Research Society for having the idea for doing this and for organizing this. I'd like to thank Jennifer Thompson and Erica Schweppes for the organizational part. We did a terrific job. I'd like to thank all of the speakers, I enjoyed all of your presentation. It was a pleasure for me to be part of this, uh, moderating this. And I'd like to thank all those who attended this meeting. I think we had like 230 people, uh, at least at the peak. 
And uh, thank you very much for your attendance. And please be aware that this is not a first and last one, but this is just the first in a series of webinars to come from the European Sleep Research Society. So looking forward uh, uh, to your presence in the future. And I wish you a nice afternoon, nice evening, nice weekend. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Dieter. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.